Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's quite courageous that so many of you are still here. I would like to thank the organizers of this meeting, especially Adelina and her team, for the uh, invitation and the excellent organization. And I would also like to congratulate them on the success uh, of the meeting so far. So the subject now will be Vanishing White Matter. And uh, this is uh, the program. I'll uh, start with an introduction. Then it was my plan to have Truus Abing talk about uh, the key success, but uh, she could not come. And so I'll talk on her behalf. And then Marianne Bujani and Paul Tesar will talk about uh, the key challenge. This is our uh, uh, membership. And it was great to have all of them involved and participate. And this is uh, then the introduction. Uh, Vanishing White Matter comprises a phenotypic spectrum and uh, the age of onset is predictive of both the clinical phenotype and the rate of progression. So the childhood onset form is most common and is mostly uh, uh, characterized by motor decline. Then the very early onset is uh, characterized by a severe encephalopathy and early demise. And the late onset form is mostly uh, characterized by cognitive decline. The disease course is chronic progressive, as well as relapsing remitting, and episodes of major decline are uh, provoked by stresses, mostly febrile infections and minor head trauma. Vanishing white matter is an autosomal recessive disease and is caused by biallelic hypomorphic variants in five genes that together encode the eukaryotic initiation factor 2b, EIF2b. Genotype phenotype correlations are limited. The pediatric Um, onset is most common. As you can see here, um, about two-thirds of the patients have an onset below the age of six. However, as the early onset form leads to an earlier death, the surviving patients have a quite different uh, distribution of age. So the current age is uh, represented in this graph, and most patients, two-thirds of the patients have an, that are living have an age above 16. And there's something else we should say, that in this graph, the adult onset patients are highly underrepresented. I think they are missed. And um, so actually, I think that the uh, surviving, the living patients, there are many adults among them. This is a summary that was made, uh, perhaps it was made by Omar, uh, of the key successes and challenges. No. <laughs> It was made by Adelina. <laughs> okay. And um, I'm briefly going over them, and then we'll discuss uh, some of them in, in more detail. So uh, the uh, success is that it, uh, research is supported by a formal expert consortium, and I'll talk a little bit about it, and uh, that we have formed an ally al alliance with the patient advocacy groups and working together. Patient uh, registry is supported by the Vanishing White Matter Consortium. We have an ongoing natural history study, uh, but we still have to work on functional outcome measures and burden of disease study is just started. Um, we have found uh, important pathways of disease mechanisms and I'll talk about that, so I'll skip those. Um, the clinical heterogeneity is a problem and also the very small numbers of patients. And then again, um, the, uh, it's mentioned that the diagnosis in adults is a problem, and then also the availability of um, mo uh, disease models also needs to be discussed. So this is our heat map. And for a disease that's not been known for so long, I think it looks pretty green. Uh, although uh, the access to therapy defying uh, disease modifying therapies is, of course, uh, actually uh, very limited at the moment. So I'll discuss the key, uh, the disease-specific key successes, which are understanding of the vanishing white matter disease mechanisms and the international collaboration. So I think that many of you have seen this graph before, but I like to, pro uh, to present it because it shows beautifully what vanishing white matter is about. The, the, this is a standard response of the body to stresses. 
uh, like viral infections, elevated temperatures, uh, amino acid starvation, protein misfolding, uh, and they all lead to the activation of different enzymes. And these different enzymes do the same thing. They lead to the phosphorylation of initi another initiation factor, EIF2. The purpose of this stress response is uh, to decrease the protein synthesis because protein synthesis is highly energy consuming. So during stress, it needs to be shut down. And the second thing is repair mechanisms have to be activated. And if they fail, apoptosis has, been, have to, has to be sent into, um, set into action. So what phosphorylation of EIF2 does is a decrease, activity, decrease the activity of EIF2B, which has two downstream effects. One is that the general protein synthesis goes down, and then the second is that the ATF4 transcription response is activated. And this, act, this response is very complex. So there are many factors produced. They are interdependent. They also regulate each other. There are multiple feedback loops, and I would like to uh, point out one. This is the COP34 uh, feedback loop. And uh, then in the end, the cell fate is decided. Either the cell is going to, uh, to recover or the cell is going to die. Now, in vanishing white matter, due to hypomorphic mutations, EIF2B activity is always decreased. That means that the AT4 transcription response is always activated. And... Um, we don't see any evidence of a decrease in general protein synthesis, and I think that is because uh, the remaining activity of EIF2B is sufficient to prevent that. What we do see in, in brain cells is the pro-apoptosis, anti-apoptosis, uh, proliferation markers, they are all activator, activated. So you see this combat in the brain. And this is highly likely the driving force behind the disease. And I would like to point out the work of Truus Abink, and this is what she did. We looked at the ISR activation in brain white matter in vanishing white matter patients, and you see all these factors activated in uh, vanishing white matter. And then the feedback loop is also activated, because this feedback loop leads to the, to the dephosphorylation of EIF2. And you can see in vanishing white matter, EIF2 to alpha phosphorylation is highly decreased and it's disease specific. We do not find it in controls and we do not find it in other diseases. Now we have uh, mouse models that are representative of the chronic disease and they have also activation of the AT4 transcriptome and what you see is the older the mice are, the sicker they are, the higher the AT4 transcriptome is. We have multiple mutants that we also crossbred, so we have different uh, se disease severity is in mice, and the sicker the mouse is, uh, the higher the AT4 transcriptome is. So there's a correlation between disease severity and uh, the level of the AT4 transcriptome. So this suggests that we could target the ISR as, uh, for treatment. The first thing that we already thought of in uh, 2001 when we found the genes is reduced ISR activation upstream of EIF2 by avoiding stresses. And that really reduces the number of uh, episodic, episodes of decline in patients, but the chronic disease goes on. In our mice, we also tried some uh, uh, ER chaperones, and that doesn't do anything for the chronic disease. Uh, then stimulate EIF2B activity. I'll talk a little bit about it. Modulate the ISR downstream of EIF2B. I'll also talk a little bit about that and reduce effects of abnormal ISR activation. And we looked at that in our mice, and that also does not really work. So there are several compounds activating EIF2B. Um, and this was found, these EIF2B activators were found by uh, the group of Sidrowski already in 2015, and multiple modifications have been used, and they all work in the vanishing white matter mice. They ameliorate motor dysfunction, they uh, decrease EIF2B activation in the brain and also improve, greatly improve, the neuropathology in the mice. So what you see here, this is the wild type mouse, then the slips on the balance beam are highly increased in the mutant mice, and then with EIF2B activators, it goes down. Average speed goes up, ATF4 goes down, CHOP goes down, triple streak goes down, so that really works. Guanabens is an old alpha-2 adrenergic antihypertensive drug, and um, it also 
impact the ISR through the GAT34 feedback loop, thus activating EIF2B indirectly. And that also works in mice. It ameliorates motor dysfunction, it decreases AG4 activation, and improves the neuropathology in fantasy work met our mice. So here you have the slips on the balance beam. This is the untreated fantasy work met our mice, and these are the treated fantasy work met our uh, mice. This is with a weekly dose, and this is with a daily dose. The, uh, this is uh, the time on the balance beam, and you can also see that decreases with treatment. AT4 goes down, CHOP goes down, Dribble Street goes down. So, um, Guanabens is also in mice effective. Then we thought of uh, more modifications, and uh, what we did is we uh, developed a CHOP knockout mouse, and that uh, is something you can do, but the CHOP knockout mouse has no phenotype. And then crossbreeding it with the vanishing white matter mouse reduces top regulated, uh, job regulated part of the ISR. So that's a narrower um, uh, modification of the ISR than the previous two I discussed, because not the whole ISR downstream of AT4 is dependent on job. Part isn't. What you see is that by crossbreeding, the uh, this is the ataxia score in an in vanishing white matter mice, and this is the double mutant. You can see how much is improved. This is the uh, slips on the balance beam in the vanishing white matter mouse, and this is in the crossbred mouse. You see it improved. Then GAT34 goes down. EIF to alpha phosphorylation is not changing. Triple 3 goes down. ATF3 goes down. And then the job the independent part of the uh, AT4 transcriptome is unchanged. And yet we have an improvement. So also a narrower uh, mod modulation of the ISR improves vanishing white matter. Now this is of course fantastic. We have a terrible disease and we have multiple uh, treatment targets. Oh. It's also a problem because uh, it's an ultra rare disease and we were contacted by multiple companies wanting to do uh, trials in vanishing white matter patients, so potentially leading to competing trials and to underpower trials. So that's why in 2019 we decided to form a consortium of clinical vanishing white matter experts and our aim was mostly uh, to govern trial development. So we are working on a core protocol that we uh, advise on um, um, sponsors in order to be able to test multiple drugs in parallel studies that are adequately set up and powered and to, sh and to ask that uh, sponsors share the placebo controls in order to minimize patients on placebo. And I'm the proud presenter of the International Vanishing White Matter Consortium and I think that most are present here. We meet uh, every month two hours online and uh, it's, it has been really a wonderful experience. It works much better than I ever could have imagined. Then the other thing is that we saw in the last couple of years that uh, patient advocates got er organized around the world. And um, I'm also very happy with that because that's very important. They are active participants in research and trial readiness. They participate in advisory and monitoring boards as needed. And uh, recently they also uh, wrote a letter that has been published online on multiple websites that they form an alliance in trial development and execution with the consortium. So I think that is a fantastic development. Then um, the key challenges are discussed by uh, Marianne and Paul. Okay, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. I am here to discuss uh, one of the key challenges for vanishing wet matter, but we would like to use vanishing wet matter as a sort of proof of principle also for other leukodystrophies and in general for neurodegenerative disorders of the brain in humans. And that is the perfect experimental model. Okay, 
Let's cut it down immediately. The perfect experimental model does not exist for any disease, meaning that there is no experimental model that fully, completely, totally, really recapitulates, and we have heard this word recapitulating a lot of times today, what the clinical disease is in the human being. So our point of view on the subject is pick your battles. So figure out a model that really recapitulates what you want to investigate and do use that model to investigate that specific disease mechanism, that specific clinical phenotype, that specific feature of the disease. So I'm here to introduce you to the key pathological features of vanishing wet matter that we feel in the, uh, how can I say, in general, in our group, uh, but we also want to share with you, should be recapitulated by one or the other experimental model. Okay, the first thing is, of course, the integrated stress response. Now, Mario talked about it. She illustrated to you the perfect ideal experimental model is an ideal in which the integrated stress response is constitutively activated exactly like it happens in the human brain tissue. Another key point of the disease are, is the relapsing remitting phenotype of the disease. So the episodes of acute neurological deterioration that occur upon stressors. As far as I know, there is no experimental model up to date that recapitulates this feature of the disease. However, this is fundamental because it can lead to acute, to a, uh, how can I say, uh, it can lead to coma and it can lead to death of the patient. So it has to be taken into account when making the perfect model. This is uh, an MRI of a patient who undergo an episode of acute deterioration and it illustrates that the white matter in the cerebral hemispheres is already affected and it doesn't change during the, the acute episode. While if we look in other areas of the brains, including the brainstem, during the episode, lesions appear in the brainstem that then with the resolving of the lesion, endogenously are able to, the brain is endogenously able to completely repair. And if we look at the neuropathology of these lesions, we find it is completely different from one, the one that is seen in the chronically degenerative cerebral hemispheres and cerebellum, in that these acute lesions in the brainstem, amongst other parts of the brain, are very much similar to what we see in relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. When acute demyelination, so loss of myelin instead of lack of myelin, activation of the immune response instead of asthenic immune response, uh, reactive gliosis instead of lack of reactive gliosis, and preservation of the axons instead of progressive loss of axons, like we would see in the chronically degenerating brain. Another aspect of the disease that would ideally have to be recapitulated by the perfect model is the microglia pathology, so the pathology of the astrocytes and the oligodendrocytes. They both share pathogenic features in that they are both immature and they completely lack the typical function of mature cells. Now, the vanishing white matter astrocytes are few. They are scars in the tissue. While the brownie-fishing white matter oligodendrocytes, especially in the areas that are relatively preserved, are heavily increased in number, up to 300-400% the normal density of these cells. But both of cells, both cell types, are affected. They both have an abnormal morphology. The white matter astrocytes are dysmorphic with very few shunt, blunt, short cell processes, and the uh, white matter oligodendrocytes are bipolar instead of being multipolar, and they are not myelin producing. Both cell types are immature. The astrocytes recapitulate the phenotype of astrocyte progenitors and the oligodendrocyte that of oligodendrocyte progenitors. And in being immature, they completely lack the functions that are typically of 
typical of mature cells, which is the glial scarring for astrocytes, and that possibly, probably correlates with the vanishing, with the destruction, the loss of the white matter in the brain, and the lack of myelin for oligodendrocytes. Now, we have experimental data that suggests that the astrocyte pathology impacts on the oligodendrocyte pathology. But at this point, with our, small, the, our models, we cannot exclude that also the oligodendrocyte pathology impacts on the astrocyte pathology. Then we have the issue of the phenotypic variability and the heterogeneity within the patient population. <coughs> There are different forms of disease which depend on the age at onset, which partially depend on the genotype, and they have different degrees of severity of the macroglia, the oligodendrocytes and the astrocytes. They have different degrees of severities of the lack of mature functions of the microglia, and they have different additional phenotypes which involve other parts of the bodies. The prenatal form of uh, vanishing wet matter is a systemic disease and it also involves the gray, heavily the gray matter with a cortical dysplasia. The adult form in the women includes also the ovaries very often. And <coughs> This phenotypic variability can in part be explained by the genotype, but probably it has also to do with the stressors, with environmental factor, and with other genetic and epigenetic mechanisms. And the last issue is the lack of biomarkers that can be used during treatment for treatment outcome. We have for sure the uh, MRI that is useful in seeing in the documenting if the disease has progressed or if it has halted, but we don't have so much other markers. We probably will develop markers related to the ISR to be, uh, how can I say, picked up in bodily fluid, but at the moment we don't have biomarkers. So now, what do we do with the, uh, with the uh, experimental models that we have? And we can clap. <laughs> well, thanks very much for the opportunity to be here. Very intimidating uh, to follow these two uh, amazing ladies. Uh, but I'll do my best to close out uh, today's session. My name is Paul Tizar. Uh, I run our research lab at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, one state over here to the west in, in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, for many of you that know me, my lab has spent most of our time uh, in the leukodystrophy space, at least focused on Plasius Merzbacher disease. Uh, and so today, uh, it's really it's an honor to, to be part of the vanishing white matter disease community, uh, although admittedly still have, still have much to learn, but thanks for welcoming me in. Uh, so what, what I thought the what we thought the challenge to do today would be uh, something that uh, could be useful to to many of the leukodystrophies, if not all of them. And you've heard this today, which is you know what 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 do we have as preclinical models, and how can we use them most effectively to both understand uh, various aspects of of the disease and also to to test and develop uh, new therapeutics. And so the, the challenge here on the next few slides is simply to, to summarize where we're at in the vanishing white matter disease uh, community. Uh, and the, the slides here aren't intended to be bullish or bearish on, on any one particular model, but simply to summarize uh, some of the strengths of uh, each of them, and, and we'll end um, in, in, in true uh, fashion for this, for this group with, with a heat map kind of summarizing uh, what each of the models uh, provide us the opportunity to use to study the, and, and potentially develop therapeutics for this disease. Uh, so I'll start with the mouse here. Uh, uh, of course, this, this disease uh, has, has a number of, of mouse models here that you can see across uh, the, the, the top here. Uh, they, they do model various uh, different uh, mutations in, in, in the different subunits uh, of the AF2B family, so in AF2B5, uh, uh, four, uh, 4 as well. Uh, and I'm not summarizing individually uh, the, the phenotypes for each of these mouse models, but uh, the mice do a pretty good job of, 
of uh, recapitulating various aspects of the human disease. And so in particular, they show decreased GEF activity, that is enzymatic acti reduced enzymatic activity of the IF2B complex. Uh, they do show ISR activation, uh, importantly in, in astrocytes in the central nervous system. Uh, a number of the models do show decreased uh, myelination and, and, and also disrupted macroglia maturation, meaning that there's immature, uh, as you saw in the, in the postmortem human tissue slides uh, uh, from Mariana previously, a decreased mature algal endocytes uh, and immaturity of, of the astrocytes. And, and so the, the, you know, the major things that the, the mice do not model are the, there's no evidence of a stress-induced uh, episodic loss of, of myelin or the cavitation that's seen uh, in, in the cortex in some human patients. And, and so what we, you know, what we really think is that these, these mice have been very useful for delineating the various pathomechanisms uh, and some of the cellular phenotypes that are associated with disease, right? And it has allowed us to gain insight into the phenotypic variability uh, and age of onset uh, in some cases, and I think most importantly has been used, uh, as you saw uh, from Mario's talk, to, to serve as preclinical models for the, for the various both academic and commercial clinical trials uh, that have been initiated for this disease. And so we're very fortunate uh, in, in this community to have an orthogonal uh, vertebrate model uh, of vanishing white matter disease, and so there's a number of, of different mutations that have been in, induced here in the various EIF2B complex family members in, in zebrafish. Um, and so these, these are, uh, these do show deficits in, in myelination. Um, they do show induction of the integrated stress response uh, and, and show, uh, at least in some of the models, disrupted maturation or, or this immaturity phenotype that we've mentioned a, a, few, a few times now. Uh, these are deletion mutations, so they're not specifically modeling uh, the exact point mutations that are seen in human. And we think one uh, exciting aspect of, of the zebrafish is, of course, the ability in, in a whole animal to do in vivo drug screening and look uh, at, at phenotypic recovery. So there are, there are other models um, uh, that I'll walk through here quickly. Um, um, of course, there are, as you've seen from many talks today, human IPS cell-based models, in particular 2D culture models looking at uh, the glial cell types, the astrocytes, the oligodendrocyte endocyte progenitor cells, as well as the oligodendrocytes. Um, in, in, in astrocytes in particular, uh, from patient-derived cells, uh, the, the field has been able to demonstrate uh, clear ISR activation in astrocytes. Uh, we've seen from co-cultures with these uh, vanishing white matter disease astrocytes that they, they do induce an algal endocyte uh, pathology. Um, the astrocytes in culture do appear uh, Im immature. And so this, you know, of course, these are individual 2D cell cultures for the most part. And so um, we have not yet seen an intrinsic algal endocyte uh, defect in, in the 2D cultures, uh, at least to my knowledge. Right, and so these human derived IP, or these human IPS cell derived cells really provide us the opportunity to explore intrinsic cellular phenotypes, right? And and the opportunity when when doing mixed cultures to be able to explore cell cell interactions uh, at the, at the single you know one one on one based cell level. And so there, another model that maybe is often underappreciated is, is, is of course, the, the non-neuronal cells, but also the biochemical models. And so, you know, these are, these are really uh, important because they, they allow us to explore, you know, specific effects of vanishing white matter mutations on the enzymatic, enzymatic function of this, of this complex, right? And so you can express these uh, various mutations in non-neuronal cells and explore uh, activity, the enzymatic activity of the complex, uh, it, it allows you to, you know, in, in, a, in a test tube to use recombinant EIF2B protein uh, to really get at how these mutations uh, affect that. And of course, one can do chemical screening or chemical testing to understand how uh, potential therapeutics can directly affect the enzymatic activity of, of this complex. But of course, these are non neuro non-neuronal, non-neural cells, and so they don't provide you with cell intrinsic cellular phenotypes uh, in, in the CNS cell types of interest. And so I'll, I'll end here before, I, before, I, before our summary heat map, uh, which is on a, a new model, and it's why I'm, 
I'm standing here today. I'm by no means an expert in any of the slides that I just, just talked about. Um, <laughs> But our, as a stem cell biology lab, uh, in, in 2018, we published uh, a cortical organoid-based model, uh, iPS cell-based model, uh, which for the first time allowed us to study uh, at least the three major cell types in, in the CNS, neurons, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes uh, in, in an organoid context. And, and for whatever reason, oligodendrocytes have been particularly challenging to coax uh, toward development in these organoid models. And so this provided us an opportunity for, for many of the leukodystrophies to allow us to study uh, cell, cellular phenotypes of those three cell types developing uh, together. And so we've, uh, we've generated uh, these 3D cortical organoids with oligodendrocytes uh, from three uh, vanishing white matter disease patients. So genotypes are shown here at the top, the R113H being the most uh, common uh, mutation in, in patients. And I'll just walk you through just uh, one or two data points. Of course, I uh, won't, won't spend much time, but just want to give you a sort of a flavor of this unpublished work uh, in the lab that's led, led by Ben Clayton, who's a postdoc. Uh, so we do see, so you can see in a carrier line uh, here, and these are whole organoid cross sections that you're seeing here. Uh, we do see ATF5 here in green, but uh, RNA-seq data of the whole, of a part of the ISAR pathway here on the right, you can see upregulation of, of ISR, specifically in astrocytes, uh, in these cortical organoids derived uh, from patients. The interesting thing here is this is really an idiopathic stress response. So in, in, in many batches, we see this. Uh, and in some batches, we do not see this stress response. And so that's not something that we uh, can currently explain. Um, uh, but it allows us to study phenotypes in the presence or in the absence of stress. We do see decreased maturation of oligodendrocytes, uh, at, at least in the, in the EIF2B5 uh, patients that we have here. So we're just measuring a mature oligodendrocytes here. You can see both in the images and the graphs. We see a decrease in, in the mature oligodendrocytes formed in the, in the presence of, of stress. Uh, this is a, 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 a more mild uh, patient here on the right, and we don't see uh, a phenotype here uh, yet in those, in those patients in that patient. And then the last slide here, which is to say that when we treat uh, these, uh, these cortical organoids um, from patients with uh, drugs to modulate the integrated stress response, in particular show you here ISRIB here in the middle, we can see a reduction of, of, of ISR, just showing you ATF5 here uh, in C2 hybridization, but we also have RNA-seq data showing that we can abrogate the integrated stress response in, in, these, in these cells. And excitingly, it allows us to see that we can quantify a, a, a partial rescue of the mature oligodendrocytes form. So both ISRIB and also uh, a sigma-1 modulator here, Prodopidine, you can see that we have an increase uh, in the mature oligodendrocytes form, but not back uh, to, to baseline levels. All right, so that brings me to uh, the heat map, not as pretty as the multicolored heat maps you've seen thus far, but uh, simple, simply, bin simply binary here. But just summarizing the, the data that, that I just presented, where the mouse models provide um, uh, a number, they, they model a number of key features of the disease, uh, but I think we, we don't see a clear episodic stress-induced loss of, of oligodendrocytes. And this is maybe uh, a, a tentative green square here uh, in our new cortical organoid model because we, we do see a worsening with, with stress uh, in this system, which may provide, with additional work, a uh, system that might be able to model this, this aspect of the disease. So I think we can uh, leave that there, and then we can, we can take questions as a group. Thank you very much. Excellent. I thought that was very succinct and to the point. Um, we can start with Kesar in the back. <clears throat> I think there's a microphone right behind you. Um, I had a question for the mouse models. Uh, do you have an idea about what cell type is driving the phenotype? Um, and could you make, you know, for example, like cell type specific excisions of the mutation? So you have an idea about what drives it? Well, uh, on the basis of the human data, we figured out uh, that the degree of associative pathology co-varies with all the other pathological features in the human brain. 
So we approached the mouse model thinking that the astrocytes would uh, drive the disease, also in the mouse model. And we could experimentally prove uh, that uh, with co-cultures, with mutant uh, and uh, uh, wild-type cells, uh, that uh, the astrocytic pathology at least drives the maturation defect of the oligodendrocytes. We don't know about other readout call. But then we thought, are we sure about that? So we have developed actually mouse models now that carry the mutations only in astrocytes, only in oligodendrocytes, and we are developing one that carries the mutation only in neurons, and we are actually characterizing it with the aim to dissect the cell autonomous and the non-cell autonomous disease mechanism that operate in this disease. Can I just add uh, data on that from, from the human iPS cell derived corticoorganoids? Is that in the absence of stress, we see an intrinsic deficit in oligodendrocyte development, whether it's uh, a, a delay, um, pr probably a delay. So we see decreased number of alg oligodendrocytes, even in mature oligodendrocytes, even in the absence of stress. But when you do see this idiopathic ISR activation, that's further further exacerbated. And when we treat with modulators of ISR, um, we, we get a rescue sort of back to the level where they were without stress, but there's still a, you know, there's still a deficit in the ability to, to form mature oligodendrocytes. And it's uh, something that we're, we're still working on extensively and we can't explain, but we think there's you know, probably two either separate or related phenotypes uh, in the astrocytes and the oligodendrocyte lineage. Questions? Yeah. Give her a microphone. Um, when I was an, a reviewer at FDA, um, and I still talk to my colleagues about this, predictive animal models was always a problem. And so my question to you, uh, especially given the, the map that you showed, have you published on that and have you shared that with regulators? Because every new FDA reviewer had to basically figure this out. And there was a database that would help them, but we needed that kind of information. So have you submitted that? Will you submit that? Maybe that's my question. <laughs> we, need to, we need to write a review about it, but this is the, actually the result of the effort that we put together in order to address uh, this uh, audience. Ali Reza. My question was for Paul. Uh, regarding how how much myelination do you see in the organoids, and if you do see myelination enough to see some degree of vacuolation? So we haven't taken, so the cortical organoid model that we have will myelinate, but it myelinates very sparsely. So there's better models. Uh, there's a myelinoid model that develop more white matter tracks where you get, you know, more dense myelin, which provides an opportunity to study phenotypes in it. But we haven't, take the we haven't taken the vanishing white matter disease organized out long enough to, to start to look at the myelin phenotypes. Uh, we, we do see an increase in sort of cystic uh, formation in the vanishing white matter disease lines um, compared to control, where you get this sort of just little cystic cavities that are lined with astrocytes on, on the outside. And it's just a phenotypic. Um, observation that we haven't put a lot of effort into, but uh, it, it possibly could um, start to model some of the cavitation events that you see in, in patients. Great. So I, so I have a question. question. Oh, I, uh, I thank you so much uh, for your nice presentation. I have a question regarding the imaging findings uh, in during the acute episodes and after that. So you showed some parts of the brain not involved during the episode, uh, acute episodes and then goes away after the episode. So my question, could you consider a short term of treatment with steroid just to decrease the disease severity or just to help the patient to increase the quality of life of the patient, just a short term treatment, not long term?
Okay, your question is concerning uh, steroid treatment. Um, I started thinking that steroids had nothing to do with the uh, battle mechanisms of vanishing white matter. The other thing is that uh, we s uh, showed ourselves, actually Marianne, that uh, hyaluronan is highly elevated in uh, vanishing white matter, uh, damaged white matter, and its production goes down with steroids. So that's sort of um, a reason why you might think of uh, giving steroid treatment. And to be honest, I think it works. If you have a patient with an acute decline and you give steroids, I think you can help the patient come out earlier. Uh, I'm not certain that it does anything on long, long term, but uh, I do think that it might help uh, patients recover from an episode sooner. So I wonder because uh, I remember in your paper you discussed that this part, of, this specific part of the brains, in terms of pathological findings, are look like multiple sclerosis or other acquired yeah. demyelinating disorders. Yeah. So that's the reason my question that I'm just not sure I think but about. It's, uh, it, I'm, not, I'm not sure that, uh, that's uh, the case. Uh, The brainstem pathology it looks like demyelination in seen in multiple sclerosis, which is not seen in the cerebral white matter. So that might also be part of the basis. But also in MS, there's it's questionable whether it has anything on the long term outcome. Uh, but I think it does something on the short term outcome. Okay. Thank you. So I think on that note, we're going to close out today's session. Be before, yeah, a pause.